Hey, hey, this is Tiger. Welcome to my stream. Hey, AJ. Nice to see you on the chat. Thank you for moderating my stream again. And hey, ZD Radar. Ein Mann hat ein Bewerbungsgespräch bei der Deutschen Bahn und kommt 15 Minuten zu spät, fragt der Personale. Wissen Sie, dass Sie 15 Minuten zu spät sind? Ja, und es ist mir egal. Sie sind eingestellt. Well, Thank you very much for contributing those German jokes at the beginning. I, let me translate it for people who don't speak German as well as you do. A man comes to an uh, employment interview with the Deutsche Bahn, the German railway company, and he's 15 minutes late, obviously, and uh, the employer guy asks him, do you know that you are 15 minutes late? And the guy says, yes, I know, and I don't care. And then the interviewer says, well, you're employed. It's not that bad with the Deutsche Bahn. And uh, I think they are doing a very good job there in, in, in what is this possible. It is not so, not so easy to work this system. And uh, um, I think they should get better credit than they are actually getting. And most of the time it works, the railway system. There are hiccups, obviously. But anyway, uh, we need them, the people working for the Deutsche Bahn. And uh, I'm happy that there are still a couple of people who are working anything in our world here. But let's go to the stream. Um, yeah, the disclaimer, please, we are talking about playing a computer game, not about uh, driving real trains or working real railway installation. Please stay away from that stuff. And uh, yeah, even though we are trying to look as thoroughly into the regulatory and technical, technical uh, concepts involved in driving trains, we are doing this on a simulator just for the fun from the safety of our homes. So don't try that in the real world, please. Yes, yeah, CD Raider says, funny thing is that exactly the same joke is told here <laughs> in Czech for the Czech Railways. Well, I think people tend to tell jokes of that kind as long as they are not in a position where they have actually to uh, provide a working railway system that is, well, halfway punctual and reliable and everything if you see what what can happens in other countries on this in this world then i'm quite happy with our railway system to be honest and i think the same is true for the czech republic but let's not get into a political discussion about uh, the appreciation of the people working for railway carriers let's get into the game what i prepared for today is another technical thing what is a follow-up to what we did uh last week last week we had um um well a glimpse in a technology that is Still a fascinating technology for me as a non-technical person and uh, what we, on the other hand, need to understand so that we know how to drive the trains that we have in the game, how to use the throttle, how to use the brakes, how they actually work and react and why it is like this. So we had to look at the hydrodynamic um, couplings, hydrokinetic couplings or transmissions on the uh, British class, British Railways class 150 stroke 2 in the West Cornwall. And uh, today we want to expand this and um, see how we can actually build working transmission as with those concepts that we had a look at and uh, how we can use that to slow down the train on the other hand. So the DLC that I picked for today is Rheinruhr Osten. Oh, there's missing the TSW3 in front of it because I used it obviously in a different context before. And I want to play a scenario, the Hibernal Heaven scenario. To use our Voslo, Voslo G6 locomotive, a little shunting locomotive that is more or less the, the newer version of the V60 that we had on the Niedertalbahn a couple of weeks ago. Um, let's try to do it from the journey. 
The locomotive is actually a funny thing to drive. There are some weird issues with the signaling and the safety uh, um, systems that are going on in those services and uh, and and scenarios. So, if it was for me, I should I, I would want to have another look at those to fix them a bit. But the locomotive itself is fun to drive, and it is one of the two vehicles in the game as far as i know that have some sort uh, of an installation that allows you to use this hydrokinetic uh, principle to slow down the locomotive and the train the other one is the baureihe 612 on the current rampant tilting train but what are we doing a freight train has freight train has broken down near schwelm and you are no i can't read it anymore we are sent out to pick them up and why did i pick this scenario here because not only have we uh, uh, do we have a lot of time to do this but also we are uh, we have the opportunity to run a multiple unit um convoy of those two locomotives the convoy might not be the correct word since both of them are actually working we are using the power of both locomotives. So we have to set it up for it to work and the scenario takes us through it. It actually works what they do and on the G6, the Vosloo G6, it is this very characteristic little locomotive and why did I say it is the uh, newer version of the V60 because again it is a locomotive that does not have more bogies but it has only three axles and uh, unlike the V60 we don't have a uh, check shaft and coupling rods but those three axles are powered or at least two of them i'm actually not sure if all three of them are powered uh via shafts that run on the inside underneath the locomotive at the front here you can see the fan there is the diesel engine providing the power underneath our cab there is the transmission and sometimes you can see here not turning at the moment there are the shafts that transport the power from the diesel engine to the wheel sets to the axles and uh, yeah first we have to set up our locomotive so that we can use it for multiple units here on this screen we can actually see a lot what is going on on the locomotive here where it says dz ist soll that is uh, the rotations per minute counter drehzahl in german and here you can see if the engine is actually running if it is idling it is running at about 600 and it can obviously be raised when uh, when used up to 700 1700 1800 and here you can at least see reliably whether you stalled your engine or whether the engine is running here on the left there is the Zugkraft that is the traction effort that you have sometimes on a on a dial on other locomotive here you have it on this scale um, those are V radar that is not for for UCD radar. This is just uh, V always means the velocity that is the speed, and this is the speed that the locomotive is supposed to go. And here it is, well, measured with radar so that you can see if it is actually going the speed that it is supposed to go. Here it is for the fuel capacity how much fuel we have in our tanks and the set lifter that is for the fan the rotations per minute for the fan so you can see if the fan is overheating this is the temperature for the cooling system Kühlwasser temperature and this is the temperature for the transmission and this is what we will be talking about the transmission today here on the uh, lower margin you can see with this red x on the KN means that we are in a traction lock at the moment. Um, KN always for kilo newton, meaning we are not uh, in a position where we can apply any uh, traction at the moment because we have not set up our locomotive yet. This means we have the brakes on, uh, the normal brakes, not the parking brakes. This thing has a working parking brake here with the red button. You apply the parking brake, then you can see this icon parking brake is applied. And by pushing the green button, you can release it. It always takes a bit because it is released with 
pressurized air. It is a, a spring-loaded brake, but the uh, setting and unsetting works with uh, pressurized air. So that was the parking brake. Here you turn on the battery. If you have a cold locomotive cold started, this is the bottom where you can then start the engine. This here is for the lights. You can set up different signals on the lights. If you put them to automatic, it's more or less always the correct thing to do. What else do we have here? Our multiple mode uh, switch, and this is what we are supposed to do in the scenario. Switch it to master on this locomotive, and you will see we have to go to the other locomotive and put it to slave. Here you have um, a mechanical gear selector, not unlike the big, big, big lever that you have on the V60 to select long distance and shunting. Here it is like a turtle, I think, and a uh, hair. You can switch between um, higher uh, 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 torque and less speed, and typically they are always set to the long distance so that we can go a longer distance. But if you encounter a problem with accelerating your train, you can always try to set this mechanical um, transmission gear switch. Uh, to the turtle position and try to if you can get your train moving then here is a cruise control but it is only for low speeds from a zero to uh, bigger than 11 actually so um, I've not really tried if that is working it is supposed to be working at least we have it here turtle position <laughs> Well, bunny position, turtle, turtle position, sometimes you need some stuff of that kind. Here you have a switch for the caps and for the step lights, and the step lights on the outside can be turned on. Here, those are the step lights. That's actually done nicely. From the outside you can push this button to turn on the step lights, and then they are on for 45 seconds, and then they turn off automatically. So now I switch them off from the inside and here you can turn them on, on for 45 seconds and then you have 45 seconds to actually make it into your cab. Then they turn off again to save energy. The sander, the, this is the wheel slip protection system that is typically activated to do it automatically. I don't know if you can actually deactivate it by pr pressing this button. I uh, have not tried it typically in, in the train sim world uh, uh, locomotives. The sander and the wheel slip protection system is, is turned on most of the time and I don't know if you can actually truly turn it off. here. If you're looking for it, this is the PZB Hauptschalter. This is where you turn on the PZB. It's the main switch and then you can put the plastic cover back on it. Here you can actually switch between PZB modes O and M and U. Typically it is set to O when we're running as a, as a light engine. It makes sense. Uh, if you don't know what piece of B mode you have to select. There is a video about setting up freight trains on my channel and it's called um, Don't break it if it ain't fixed and there uh, I elaborate how to set up a freight train with all the correct PCB modes and the brake settings. We will just leave it for O here at this point. Here, this second switch, it is called the PZB Störschalter, not the main switch, but, well, the malfunction. Uh, <laughs> you love that episode name, AJ. Thank you very much. Um, very good video. Thank you. Thank you, CD Radar. Um, yeah, I like... Uh, this is actually a very interesting stuff, because there you can actually use fairly complicated stuff from the real world in the game and, and it, uh, the game provides the possibility to do all this set up. So this is something that I highly appreciate in the game that you can use all those levers on the freight cars for the brake selectors and for the load selectors on, on the vehicles where you have one. That is very good. What is not so great is that a switch that is labeled PZB malfunction switch are, um, is actually the switch where you turn on the CIFA 
and turn it off. So that is obviously not the correct labeling for that. All right, this is what we had to do here on our locomotive. I spent a bit more time to elaborate way what would we have on this screen. I really like this screen. You can see a lot what is happening on your locomotive here. You can see from the inside you have two uh, command stands, one facing uh, either direction for going backwards and forwards. This is very convenient. Um, so you always have a great view and it does not matter in what direction you are going. That thingy here, we know that actually from the V60 this is a remote control so it is not working in the game but in real life you'd be able to take this thing go out stand for example at the other end of your train and remote control your locomotive so that you do not need a, a second person that you do not need our colleague hank um uh to to do the shunting so you know, one person actually can do the shunting and uh, remote control the engine we can at least see the remote control, we can see the, the charging station for that, but we cannot use it in the game. This is the emergency stop plunger. Don't confuse it with the hat stand. Here you can actually put on your hat. Um, if you go out, you are supposed to uh, wear a hard hat so uh, that nothing happens to your precious head. And uh, to put it back, you click on that stand again when you're inside. Uh, what happened to me actually, I tried to put it here on, on the emergency stop plunger and then obviously the train performed an emergency stop. So careful not to confuse the hat stand with the emergency stop plunger. Um, what I really like on this locomotive is that you have uh, a compartment on the outside where you can open that here and this is for turning on and off the brake system. So if you're actually cold starting the locomotive you have to close this valve otherwise your brake system will not be operational. And here you can see a little uh, picture. If I crouch down you can see all the other uh, things that describe what you can see here. That is done nicely. I always like it if there are compartments on the outside where you can look behind the scenes. That adds a lot to immersion. This is this is so great on the old machines on Sandpatch Grade where you can actually open up the engine compartment and start the, the engine there. Um, yeah. So much for that. You have working indicators for the brake system, green because the parking brake is not applied. This is always the symbol for the parking brake. This zigzag line indicates that it is a spring loaded brake and you have all seen that we just released it. What is not so great is that the green icon has a black dot in it because the green one should not have a black dot, the red one should have a black dot. Why is that? This is, I think I've already explained it in a different video, this is for people who have this uh, uh, condition in their eyes that they cannot distinguish between red and green uh, reliably. And uh, so that those people can actually um, distinguish whether the brake, the brake is applied or not applied, the red one has the dot and the green one hasn't and if you put the dot in both then obviously this does not work um, so yeah here the screen field should not have a dot in it and the red one should have the dot and this is for the regular air brake and this one is applied so that our locomotives do not run on their own let's make our way into the cab of our second locomotive And this one we have to switch to slave. Obviously here on this one we do not switch on the CIFA and this uh, the, the PZB because we have that on our leading one. And we can close this door again and step on to our leading locomotive. If you want you can put on a second head by the way. The, se the second locomotive has a second head. And you can put it on too. 
Well, I think one hat is enough. Now we return it. We can finally start with our with our mission. The scenario is leading us through. You can see we have two buttons, just like on the V60, on the modernized version of the V60, that we have to press for going both forwards and backwards. And uh, now they are sending us through Wuppertal, Langerfeld. Uh, this DLC here, uh, Rheinruhr Osten, is a great DLC. Um, it's quite old, but it has two wonderfully big yards where you can do a lot of shunting. Um, I would fix the signaling and the safety system stuff a bit in, in this DLC, especially as much as the G6 is concerned. But nevertheless, it is still a great DLC in my opinion. So, do we have lights on our locomotive? The leading one has lights, that is good. What does the signaler say? Proceed as signals indicate. Here you can always look if there is a little dwarf signal that you might not see. This one, this lever here is for the train brake, the air brake. We can put it into release. We can see on the white hand here that the brake cylinder pressure is going out, is falling. And the red hand here is the brake pipe. We have a local brake that we put into release as well. And then we use our combined power and brake handle to accelerate. It has this funny uh, way of driving this locomotive that you push the lever into the increased direction and hold it as long as you want the power to increase and then you let it snap back into the hold position and if you want it to not count down to zero slowly but to drop to zero at once and you push it into the hold position once more. On this thingy here you can see whether you are applying power or whether you are applying brake force. Oh Ronnie, hey, see you on the chat. Good thing that you joined, you can enlighten us with a lot of uh, shunting issues that might happen on this scenario here. For people who don't know Ronnie, Ronnie is actually a real train driver in Germany, running ICE trains though, not so much shunting services. We are allowed to go 40. Yeah, sometimes you have a limit of 25, sometimes you have a limit of 40. Oh, shunting, great fun. <laughs> not. <laughs> have you ever driven a G6? I, I doubt it. And we are going to do a Sperrfahrt again because we are picking up another train that has uh, that has broken down. Since I introduced Ronnie, I want to introduce my friend CD Radar from the Czech Republic. He's a real train driver too. And he drives metro trains in Prague. Are you currently shunting or at Zugfahrt? I guess I am at Zugfahrt now. Because we are supposed to leave the shunting area here. But to be honest, they don't take it so seriously here with the signals and the distinction. I think they, they let us pass the next red signal. Oh, we are getting a active 500. So even though we have a go via indication, we have to prepare to stop in front of that red signal ahead. Using our hydrodynamic brake. What that actually is, we will see later on. This is the first main signal that we are going to pass. And it is red and I think they will uh, switch it. Now I actually don't know what they switch it to. They switch it to green, so we are at Zugfahrt. But later on we will turn into a... Sh yeah, <laughs> we will be a shunting service on blocked track actually. I came through glass. Yeah, uh, true. 
I forgot to open the window to do that. Thank you for reminding me. What is the limit here? We can accelerate to 60 at this point. We started out with a speed limit of 40, so... Um, I'm not entirely sure if we started as a Zugfahrt. I guess we did. Yes, it's cold. It's cold inside because I opened the window, but now I open it so that I don't bump my head. So for now the signaling is actually clear. On our way back we will get some weird sig signaling sequence. Would have been 25 till the signal. Yeah, and it was 40 until the signal. So probably we started out already as a, as a Zugfahrt. Oh, I did not really release my local brake. That's just why it was... We are so slow. There is a, I think it's a 422 S bahn overtaking. So, if I remember this scenario correctly, we will be stopped at the second signal from here and then we have to enter a block where the broken train the broken dra the broken down train is sitting in and there they will let us in as a as a shunting service but at the same time limited to 50 the 50 will be actually a sperrfahrt i guess that is the limit that typically is assigned to Pult Sperrfahrten. Here is the VR Zero. Actually, we are getting our thousand hertz. And we are going slowly. If you're using the air brake on this locomotive in snowy conditions, be prepared for a lot of wheel slips that you're getting. Ronnie, what are you saying? Got a real nice and unexpected si shift on Sunday. You're supposed to drive an empty stock move from Munich to Frankfurt with an ICET. That is cool. I did not know that the ICETs are, are still active. That is a tilting ICE, isn't it? Oh, I should pay attention that I don't stall my train. Is that, by the way, prototypical that those little dwarf signals are showing an SH-1 um, instead of being just turned off when we are running as a Zugfahrt here? That's what I've always been wondering. Yep, still running strong the ICET tilting train. I've never been on an ICET. Why would they be off? Because at the station where I sometimes have to wait for a train, they are typically turned off, those little shunters. It's a different thing. I always have been wondering why it is allowed to pass them if they are just turned off. I guess because they are dwarf, sig dwarf signals. Hano by any chance? No, it's not Hano. Using the dynamic brake, the hydrodynamic brake, for it to be effective, don't put it on too, too little. Just go to 60%. 50% so that it actually has some effect. Slow down the train to 10 kilometers per hour for example and for the rest 
use the local brake or the air brake at least this is what I have found out that works by default they are supposed to be set to SH1 good thing then I will have to ask whoever is responsible for the signals at my place yeah you can see we getting wheel slips here until we finally get to stop contact the dispatcher to receive entry permission for the occupied track once received approach the train with reduced speed okay there was a orange uh, wheel slip light here on the cap by the way here the cap indicators you can see the indicators for the piece at B flashing alternatingly 70 85 meaning we are in a restricted 500 Hertz monitoring at the moment and because we stopped in front of the red signal okay signaler allow us to pass let's see what he gives us he gives us an HP zero with an SH1 and uh, at set S3 showing 5 allowing us 50 as a shunting service into the occupied track if that is prototypical you have to tell me I don't know um, at any rate we are allowed to pass it release the air brakes and apply some throttle and now passing the red we should use our our Befehl 40 override key but this is not what the game wants here they want us to acknowledge the thousand hertz what is a bit weird in my opinion I would have expected the Befehl 40 indicator turning on when I uh, hold down the override key while passing this signal um, but this is not what you need to do here according to the game the, the game wants you to push the Wachsamkeitstaste the acknowledge key after passing the signal and then it starts a thousand hertz PCB monitoring that wants us to slow down to 80 okay Ronnie says yeah that's not right you're not a Zugfahrt so ZS3 signals aren't for you anyways yeah So they should have given us a green with the set as 3 showing 5, right? No, they shouldn't have uh, given us a green because the train is sitting there. They can't give us a green. They should not have removed the red one, but have given us a written order telling us not to go faster than 50. I think this is... and then we would be a Sperrfahrt again. So they can't switch it to green because the train is obviously in the block. But they can't send us out as a shunting service and allow us to go 50 with a ZS3. And then... Now you'd be the Sperrfahrt. You'd get the Befehl for that signal as well as for the Sperrfahrt. Yes, that's what I meant. And then they leave the signal as a red. As a full red. Don't show an SH1 with it. Don't switch it to anything else, but give us the the schriftlichen Befehl, the written order. Anyway, let's assume we got a written order limiting us to 50. Well, as a Sperrfahrt, we are obviously always limited to 50 if we are going as a light engine or pulling. We've had this in, in the video two weeks ago, I think. If we are pushing as a Sperrfahrt, we are limited to 40 unless there are not technically secured uh, level crossings in the track. Then we are limited to 20 as a pushing Sperrfahrt, if I remember it correctly from two weeks ago. Well, now we are approaching the train. not going too fast from this section here in the track where well, it's really a nice gorge 
we will be going downhill. And since I'm talking so much and reading the chat so much, I really have to pay attention that I'm not going too fast. And don't bump into that broken down train head on. Push 30. Yeah, non technically should be on route 20. Yes, thank you very much. Not 40, I said 40, but it's 30. 50, 30, 20. And at the same time, well, a bit faster we can go, I guess. If we are a Kleinwagen part, right, I remember that. But there is no Kleinwagen in the game. I, I actually, I remember googling what a Kleinwagen is. And I was enchanted to find that there is a thing as a Schwer Kleinwagen, right? So that is a, <laughs> a little car, but heavy. I left out uh, the Kleinwagen stuff in my video because I did not want to confuse everyone. But many different things and definitions. A schwer Kleinwagen that is a heavy little vehicle. That is a great German word. <laughs> So, you can see the train that we are supposed to pick up, sitting there in the ascent and the scenario is actually a bit of a joke because in the journey for the Rhein-Ruhr-Osten you have a service with the Trax 2 that is sitting there where you always get stalled on this uh, hill here where you cannot get it across. across this ascent Bonks. That was a bit harder than I wanted it to kiss. But anyway, we are here. Now we're supposed to couple, so we should maybe apply up some brakes. Don't forget our hard hat. Leave it into apply. So that our train doesn't run away. So we're coupling to the train. It's always a bit difficult to find if there is actually no step where we can step on it. Here we're coupling with a screw coupling. In real life the G6 would have one of those fast coupling devices for shunting. Just like the V60 has in the game. Set the power and brake to off. On our locomotive that we used as the leading locomotive so far, the power and brake to off. Alright. Press the forwards button on desk 1 to deactivate this desk here. Set the multiple unit mode of the second locomotive to slave, because we are switching between master and slave now. Set the multiple unit mode on the, new, on the now leading locomotive to master. Okay, that is the other one, and before we do that, the scenario does not tell us, but we are using the safety systems on this locomotive, and uh, to not confuse the locomotives, we should not forget 
to turn off the PZB and the CFAR here. Again, even if it says PZB Störschalter, this is the CFAR switch. Are they both deactivated? Yes, so we can put the... No, I wanted to put the cover on. Cover. Crouch in front of this nice thing. Master. Alright. Set the reverser to neutral. And now, don't be confused. Now the game is talking about the trucks too that we are supposed to tow. Here, this one. And important if you play this scenario, don't sit in the driver's seat of this locomotive, otherwise you will utterly confuse the game, because then the game will take this locomotive as the leading one, and the two other ones get confused totally. So everything that we need to do here is to uh, put the switch to neutral first, then we lower the pantograph on this locomotive, at the same time the main circuit breaker is set to off if the pantograph is lowered, and then we can set the master switch to off so that we can use this locomotive just like any vehicle in the train and that it reacts to our setting for the uh, brake pipe especially. Now we can go back to our now leading locomotive and sit in the driver's seat. We take this driver's seat here now I don't know what to do with my helmet, because on this locomotive the helmet is already there. Again, don't confuse the emergency stop plunger with the helmet stand. It is really difficult. Uh, the, 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 the end sign, the set G2 off, not quite sure, but I think you turn the 85 off completely. Um, what else can I do to turn it off completely? The I can remove the, 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 the handle for the reverser, probably. Um, but I remember that we had battery, hours, uh, battery of OK. I don't want to try it in this scenario because I don't want to confuse it, actually. But it's a good thing, yeah. Probably we would just turn it dead, that it does not interfere anymore. The problem is I remember that there was a problem uh, with push-pull trains with a Trax 2 that when turning off the Trax 2 completely then you couldn't really control the brake pipe from from the cab car because it was always interfering. What does he say? Schleppen ohne Batteriespannung wenn keine ZS vorhanden, meine ich. Wenn keine, what is, what is ZS? Zugsammelschiene? He says towing without battery on, if there is no set S. Yeah, Zugsammelschiene, that is, that, is the, that is the one cable that connects the power for driving all the uh, vehicles in the train. Well, probably that, that would be the correct thing to do. I, uh, I choose not to interfere with the scenario here at this point. Uh, <laughs> Um, well, forwards on desk 2, this is that one, so I can go, because now you would be confusing the loco in real life, I'd say, yes, I understand, so you, you would just turn off the tracks 2, so that it does not uh, get confused, because it is actually running, although it should not be running, and um, there is no way to set the, the, the tracks 2 to slave, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that you're putting your two cents in, into this. Um, towing locomotives, building consists of more than one locomotive, especially of different kinds, is obviously a thing that is difficult in real life and even difficult, more difficult in the simulation, I guess. I remember, and this is my two cents on this matter, I, I remember reading an uh, incident report uh, from uh, uh, ab about uh, an incident a couple of years ago when, when some guy uh, was supposed 
to run a little train composed of two vectors, I think, from one station to the other, and he only connected the data wire and failed to uh, connect the, the screw coupling and, and the brake pipe, and... Uh, and then uh, halfway between the two stations he lost his, his second locomotive because at first it was just driving along uh, according to the the, the uh, orders sent by by the uh, electric cord and then in some point the distance between the two locomotives increased too much and, and then the plug was pulled and then the rear locomotive was on its own and driving around uh, without a driver and disconnected from the other locomotive and they had to derail it somewhere. Uh, so it's a diff difficult thing and Ronnie says, yeah, I don't get why they continue to put such things in their sim if they are not doing it correctly. That That's a thing. Actually, I enjoy it, putting stuff like this in and it actually gives you some uh, some opportunity to think about what or how would it be in real life. So I, I actually would encourage them to do that. Maybe there should be a disclaimer telling us that this is probably not prototypical of what they are doing here. Um, we are supposed to drive our train home now. I think at this point in time I would interrupt the stream and the scenario for the presentation. Coming back to what I wanted to talk today, the hydrokinetic transmission. And in the video uh, last week, we had talked about the Föttinger principle and how the hydrokinetic transmission actually works, how a fluid coupling works and the torque converter works. And we have seen that we have a pump impeller wheel that is driven by the diesel engine. And there is a fluid around this pump impeller wheel um, and oil typically. And the particles of this oil are uh, accelerated by this rotating impeller wheel so that they are fleeing the center and at the same time are accelerated in a uh, radial fashion and with this m moment that they got that they get this momentum that they get from the impeller wheel they hit the turbine wheel that is set around it and has blades as well and when the piece of liquid in my imagination hits the blades on the turbine wheel then the turbine wheel is actually accelerated a bit whilst the liquid is pushed to the side so if the turbine wheel is not rotating and the impeller wheel is rotating hard then we will have a lot of torque transferred from the impeller wheel via the liquid to the turbine wheel and the turbine wheel that is connected with the wheel is starting with the wheels of the locomotives is or the uh, DMU is starting to rotate and at the same time the fluid is uh, put or pushed to the side then there comes a point where the turbine wheel is accelerating in its uh, rotating uh, way and the harder the turbine wheel is rotating the less the fluid is pushed to the side so if you start your vehicle or if you start driving into this fluid coupling then the fluid is pushed aside uh, very much and the turbine wheel is accelerated a bit and as soon as the turbine wheel is rotating faster then the fluid will stream more directly to the outside and there comes a point where the turbine wheel is rotating as fast as the impeller wheel and then the fluid just goes to the outside without transferring a lot of torque anymore and this is more or less an automatic system for applying a lot of torque when torque with low rotating speed when we are just starting our train or going slowly and uh, transferring not so much torque by with with higher rotation speeds when we are going fast um, we have learned that this is good for that but not enough to actually start a train not enough for the losbrechen that we need and so we need some device that actually allows us to transfer the torque uh, to the expense of rotating speed and for that we have looked at this from the side 
turned it by 90 degrees so the red impeller wheel would be that one and the blue turbine wheel would be that one and here is the channel where the liquid can run and where the blades are and we put it in a casing and then we have this remaining space where we can put something else in and uh, if we would not want to have a torque converter then we could just build it like this the red one inside the blue one and then we would have the liquid rotating in a donut shaped uh, room inside this coupling a uh, torus is the exact word i think but as a donut we can uh, understand it even better i think so you would have this donut and the liquid would rotate inside this donut not only um in this uh on this plane that you can see here but you would have a rotating uh, stream of liquid that goes more or less this way around the torque converter or the coupling and for converting the torque you can put a third wheel inside this coupling that is a fixed wheel so this is actually connected uh, with the casing so that it can't uh, rotate but it uh, influences the stream so if you put blades in this wheel as well then you enlarge this rotating fashion so without that yellow wheel this guide wheel you would have a quite tight uh, rotating uh, spiral here and with the yellow wheel you can make it larger i've put the uh, yellow wheel here on this diagram so you can see what it looks like from turned around 90 degrees and if you uh, increase the rotating momentum of your liquid then it has already a momentum along the donut when it hits the impeller wheel so that at the same time the momentum with which the stream of liquid hits the blades of the turbine wheel of the blue wheel is greater so that you can transfer more torque uh, that way to the expense of rotating speed so these are the two principles um, if you want to hear it a bit longer this explanation uh, just watch the video that i posted one week ago on my youtube channel today we wanted to see how we can use this principle to build transmissions and how to use it to slow down our trains so let's say this is the shaft that comes from the diesel engine so this is rotating and we want to transfer this rotating moment to the wheels we take a second shaft this is the blue shaft because it is connected with our blue turbine wheels this is the shaft that is supposed to transport the rotating momentum to the wheels and with this shaft we connect the parts for here a, here a fluid coupling and here a torque converter and on this blue rotating shaft we built so this is the turbine turbine wheel and we put the red impeller wheel on top in a way that the red part it is like a doggy bone right it can rotate around the same axis that the blue thing can rotate it is more or less like a sleeve around the blue shaft and it can rotate independently on the blue shaft and as long as there is no liquid in those thingies it can uh, the, it, not, nothing stops it from just rotating inside the blue uh, 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 installments so let's put a casing around this and we have here our flute coupling the red impeller wheel the blue turbine wheel with the blades obviously connected directly together so that we do not do not waste any any streaming energy on on the uh, torque converter here we need some room to put in our guide wheel again uh, colored in in yellow the guide wheel and so we have a torque converter so we have a fluid coupling and a torque converter on one shaft on one axle actually and from the shaft that comes from the diesel engine we are rotating 
the red impeller shaft because this is where we want to have the rotating movement that comes from the engine and how do we do that uh, in modern hydrokinetic transmissions as far as i have seen they use a so-called step up gear that is a big cog that drives a much smaller cog that is connected to the red shaft so if you look at it from the side it looks like this this is the big step up gear that comes from the diesel engine and the small very, very much smaller uh, cog or gear that is connected with the red pump impeller shaft so that the pump impeller is actually rotating much faster than the shaft that comes from the diesel engine and then you have the red shaft uh, rotating and as long as there is no liquid no oil in the transmission in the fluid coupling or the torque converter nothing happens because the oil is the connector between the two parts of this of the fluid coupling or the torque converter and you connect this with some uh, hoses and a pump and at the same time this shaft is driving the pump and the electronics in the transmission decide whether they put oil into the fluid coupling or they put oil into the torque converter. And if you're just starting your engine, the electronics would decide, okay, we need a lot of torque to get this thing uh, started. So we put our oil in the torque converter. And then at a certain point, the electronics just measure that and they are predefined at what point they switch that. They drain the torque converter and put the oil into the fluid coupling. This is those this switching process that we have seen a week ago on the class 150 stroke 2 at about I think 48 miles. <clears throat> and this is done by the transmission electronics that is set to a certain behavior. And so you can decide whether you are using the torque converter or the fluid coupling. And that is quite clever. And if you just want your uh, transmission to free wheel like when you're coasting and the engine is just idling, you just drain both. And then the red impeller shaft can uh, be moved on idling speed and the shaft that is connected to the wheels, the blue one, can rotate faster than the red impeller shaft with no fluid in between. Nothing happens. It just rotates around it without wear and without tear. Yeah, and how do we get this to the wheels then? We could just connect the wheels here with different shafts, but we need a reverser as well. So how do we fix the reverser into that concept? We put a cock on this blue shaft and we take another shaft that is <coughs> on a different axis. And we have here two cogs again, and this is the shaft that goes to the wheels, that drives the wheels then more or less. And how do we get this to be a reverser? Let's have a look at this from the side. You have two cogs, more or less the same size, so that you don't have a, a transmission thing here. One is connected with the blue one, one is connected with this gray shaft here. And to, for it to be a reverser, you put a second cog on this shaft that is a bit smaller. And on top of this construction, one more cog. And Maybe you know those those riddles or, or things that there used to be around somewhere where you had to find out in which direction a cog at the end is turning if a crank is turned in a certain direction. Just like this, add one more cog and the gear at the end turns into the opposite direction. And how is it done? You put it, if you look at it from the side, it looks like this. this orange cog is a bit out of the uh, out of the of the same plane here so the blue shaft transfers it to the orange cog and if you want to switch between those two cogs you have to move this shaft a bit forwards or backwards and this is done hydraulically or pneumatically or mechanically you can do that whatever you want and then this cog here is no longer connected to this cog but to the orange cog and if you look at the rotation direction let's say this blue shaft is turning that direction then the gray shaft is going and turning into that direction here the blue shaft is turning in the same direction again turning around 
the orange direction into that direction and accordingly this output cork would just turn into the opposite direction. So this is one way to build a mechanical reverse unit at the end of your hydrokinetic transmission. Um, and actually this is a setup more or less obviously not in every technical detail but from the logic principles that are involved here and not more I can tell you I am not a technical person I uh, am not a mechanical engineer or an engineer at all but the logical principles involved uh, are the same in as in in the transmissions that are built in the British Rail Class 150 stroke 2 for example or the British Rail Class 166 the networker turbo for whatever reason it is called a turbo because this is called a turbo transmission and most of those transmissions are built by a company uh, that is called Voigt uh, residing in southern Germany in Baden-Württemberg and they are building a lot of transmission of that kind more or less Sometimes you get the impression that they are the only one building transmissions of that kind. Uh, yeah. So this is a setup, mechanical transporter, uh, tra uh, mechanical reverser, and a setup with a fluid coupling and one torque converter. Tor one torque converter for the slow speeds and a fluid coupling for the fast speeds. Used on many, many DMUs, diesel multiple units. So what if you want to use more than one torque converter? So you see I renamed this torque converter 1. Sometimes you need more than one ratio here because you, you need uh, even more increments in, in your torque. Like on trains that are going even faster than, than those, those DMUs that are going whatever, 120, 140. If you want to go 200 km, kilometers per hour, then you maybe you need not only one torque converter, but, but two. One for starting the train, one for going, and then at the end a fluid coupling for the high speed uh, area. Um, yeah, if you look at this with this red bone, this bone can obviously only have two sides and be enclosed on the other end by the blue installations on this, on this blue shaft. Um, there is no way to fix a third wheel or a third uh, installation of that kind on our red bone. But what can we do? We can build another shaft that is more or less built in the same way on the other side because that cork here in the middle obviously is round and on a round cork you can put a lot of shafts uh, around it. So we will just double this installation here and then change the layout of the guide wheel change the angle of the blades and if you're changing the angle of the blades more or less you can change the ratio of the torque the torque being converted this is why i put in a green guide wheel here to uh, show that this is a different ratio it's a different torque converter and this is the torque converter two then and then i have one for starting the train one for mid-range speed and then i have the fluid coupling for high speed obviously i have two fluid couplings now they are not really necessary so let's remove the fluid coupling here but what can we do with it then you have seen maybe what i have done here i have just cut the red bone the pump impeller so that it does not reach this casing anymore and then i use this part of the blue uh, turbine wheel and pitch it against a fixed bladed wheel that is connected with the casing and what why would I do that because this way I can slow down the train in a situation where I fill my uh, oil into my hydraulic oil into this uh, compartment here then the running wheels of the train would turn this blue shaft, this blue shaft will turn this blue wheel and this wheel would pitch the oil against the fixed blades of the casing, of the fixed wheel that is not turning and this will slow down 
the movement in the blue shaft. So this can be used for slowing down the train. And this is the hydrodynamic brake that is called a retarder, in principle, obviously. And again, by deciding into which one of those gadgets you fill your hydraulic oil, you decide whether you are using torque converter 1 or torque converter 2, or the fluid coupling, or the retarder. And this is the setup, uh, as much as I understand it. Yeah, uh, but before that, the reverser obviously needs to be doubled as well here, right? Again, we have a mechanical reverser. We are switching our output uh, shaft between those two setups, one with the uh, additional orange cog and one without it. And same principle again, but we need to go from both sides, obviously. What you also see is that this part here, where you have no part of the red bone anymore, can be also put on the end of our primary shaft or of the first shaft of the first blue shaft that we have here so it fits here the blue one just goes on and rotates in the casing since the shaft that is turning around the blue shaft does not need to go on here it is not the problem we can have those three things in line this is why a lot of those dmu type transmission can be uh, extended to have a uh, retarder and then you don't need the second shaft anymore. And this is a setup that is, I don't know that, I don't think that this is in the game, but it can be, from what you can read, actually found in real life. Um, but go, let's go back to this setup with two uh, rotating shafts that are driven by the step up gear with two torque converters, one coupling and one retarder. And this is the setup that you would find on the tilting train in the Taranta Rampe, the Baureihe 612. And on this one, if you look at the Bremsanschrift, the brake marking on this train, you can find this very rare marking of H. And the H is for the hydrodynamic brake. You can see that this train here obviously has a brake uh, system that is designed by the company Knorr. It's a Knorr Bremse, the Einheitsbauart with brake setting R only, so no G, no P, but only R with automatic load change and the magnetic track brake and the hydrodynamic brake, the retarder. Uh, it has brake discs, it is a uh, high efficiency brake, this is why it has this R in this rhomboid, and then it has the brake, uh, the the brake weight for air brake, this is R, plus hydrodynamic brake, plus a magnetic track brake, uh, and then in every combination, air brake with magnetic track brake only, air brake with uh, hydrodynamic brake, and air brake alone. So this is the only vehicle in the game where I have found it in the brake marking that it has a hydrodyna dry hydrodynamic brake a retarder. Um, yeah, and what is with our Voslo G6 that we are driving today in our scenario? Doesn't it have a hydrodynamic brake as well? Well, yeah, it has. If you play the the uh, introduction uh, to this locomotive, they tell you specifically, yes, it has a hydrodynamic brake and we have used it already. But why does it not have an H in the brake setting? I just go back to the game for that to demonstrate now we're at the end of the train let's go back here if you look at the brake markings here it just say Knobremse der Einheitsbauart settings G and P with additional brake this is the parking brake <coughs> and discs brake discs no H no hydrodynamic brake so is that Another error? No, I don't think so. If you look at pictures of real G6s, they all have this uh, brake marking that you can find in the game. And why is that? Because there is a second way how you can use turbo transmissions to slow down the train without using a retarder, without pitching the turning wheels against a fixed uh, wheel on this one. Let's see how that works. 
Yeah, but first one word about the Baugai 628.2 CD radar. Thank you very much for sending me a picture of one of those thingies in real life, <coughs> as they are used in the Czech Republic still. Um, what kind of transmissions uh, do they use? Uh, it depends on actually the dot number behind it. In the beginning, they obviously had drives with two torque converters and one fluid coupling. Um, then it was reduced or enlarged, I don't know. At least some of them have two converters, one fluid coupling. Some of them have only one converter and one fluid coupling, just like the British trains that we had on the slide before. Some had a retarder from it, what you can read. Um, but uh, so they have different setups here. This is why I put it at the end. But they also have uh, those hydrokinetic transmissions here. But back to our, or now let's go to our G6 here. How can we slow down the train without using a retarder? Let's get rid of the retarder because we don't have the H in the brake marking. And well, let's go let's get rid of the fluid coupling because we have a shunting locomotive and we don't want to go high, high speed with our shunting locomotive but we need probably two torque converters for the different speed ranges one for starting the engine one for going a bit faster what we can do we can still keep the two blue shafts but instead of a retarder and a fluid coupling we can put two more torque converters on the other end of the red bones here and then we can just double the setup we can remove the green guide wheel here and insert a yellow one meaning that those torque converters are identical have the same ratio torque converter 1a torque converter 1b and the other two torque converters we set identically to torque converter 2A and torque converter 2B. So on the green ones and on the yellow ones, we have uh, the same r uh, ratio for the conversion uh, on both axles. So what does it? So why would we do that? Why would we want two axles that have actu ac actually the same setup? <clears throat> we get rid at the same time of our mechanical reverser. We throw out this here. And we throw out that way and we condense it in a way that it looks if you look at it from the side like this so no mechanically moving part in the reverser anymore but we have two blue rotating shafts one output shaft and one of the blue rotating shafts is connected directly with the output and the other one via the additional orange wheel permanently no shifting anymore and this is what is called a turbo reverser and how does it work? If we are just using one side, the upper side, for example, or the lower side, we have different directions. So let's start with the lower one that is connected directly. If it is turning that way, then the output shaft is turning that way. Again, this blue one turns the same way as this blue one because they are both connected with the same step up gear. So this is turning into the same direction. The orange wheel is turning like this and the output is turning in the opposite direction. So we can reverse our direction by just filling the appropriate torque converter without any mechanical switching anymore. So no wear and tear in the reverse here. And at the same time, when we are going into direction A and we are using oil in the torque converters of direction B, then we can use it just like in a retarder to slow down the train hydrodynamic or hydrokinetic braking by using the opposite side uh, of, of the converter layout that would usually be used to um, yeah propel the train in that direction you cannot use it just like uh, when you're running because you have to stop the engine switch it around but as long as you're going into direction A for example and you fill oil in the torque converter B side then you are slowing down the train and vice versa so you have a wear and tear free reverser and at the same time the possibility to slow down your train uh, without wear and tear on, on, uh, on the air brake 
And this is what we have on our Voslo G6 that we are driving today. This turbo reverse is set up without a retarder. So if you look up those transmissions on the Voslo uh, website, you will find those um, shunting locomotive transmissions <coughs> that tell you that they are turbo reverses and they have no indication that you can add a retarder because you don't need one. And then the uh, brake marking is accordingly without the age, but still you can have a hydrokinetic, hydrodynamic brake facility on this on this locomotive. That's it for today with the theory. Um, again, my apologies, my apologies for everyone who is actually a technical expert on this on this stuff. I am trying to explain this in a way that non-technical people just like I am can under understand the gist of it and uh, yeah I think this is what I, I tried to find out to understand how this locomotive that we are running here is working so that we know what to do and how to drive it and this is why we need to apply quite a lot of braking force uh, before we actually see an effect because how is it how, how is it done that we can apply more or less brake force in the hydro uh, dynamic brake we put more or less oil into uh, the converters and then the brake effort is more or less and if you only put in a little oil then there is obviously not a lot happening and slowing down so you need to set your uh, dynamic brake to 50 or 60 so that you can actually see some effect all right thank you for bearing with me through this um, theoretical part still I think this is quite interesting so our train is running backwards already so we'll have to make sure that we catch that with our and this is a problem Obviously, that we have in the snowy conditions. So, better stop it again and try again. From a new, let's give it some propulsion force be before we release the brake completely so that we maybe manage to get our train uphill It is coming. It is coming. Careful not to overdo it. Otherwise, the wheels will slip. Did we turn on the CIFA and the and the piece of B on that one here? No, we forgot. Can't do that here without moving the camera. So now we have working safety systems on this locomotive. And we managed to get the train moving. Where is a camera where we can actually see what we are pulling here? Two working G6s pulling the broken down trucks too and the freight train uphill yes I enjoy a lot of engine roaring on these trains here yeah <clears throat> nice engine sounds let's put those cameras around a bit more
So the game will allow us to go 80. I'm not going 80 here. I still consider myself as a Sperrfahrt and limited to 50 since we are pulling and there are no level crossings that are not technically secured in the track. <clears throat> Even though we are getting normal signals for, for a train service here. We are still towing. Now we are going across the summit, so be prepared for the train pushing us down heavily. For that I just let it coast a bit. We're still losing, but not much. That means the center of gravity is almost across the summit. And as soon as we are picking up speed, I will just yank in the hydrodynamic brake fully and if we're still going too fast I will apply some air brakes on top of it if you just try to slow down the train with the air brake alone you will most probably get wheel slips well um, I know it because I know the route so I know where the summit sh should be and then you can feel it in your train. You can hear it on the engine noise, you can feel it from how the needle on the speed clock is moving or not moving. So in my opinion if, if you um, get used to it a bit, you can more feel it than know it whether your train is going uphill or downhill. And now you can see that it is going downhill. But you can can't, can't see it via the train tracks. No, I can't see it on the train tracks. So now I'm mixing in air brakes so that we don't go faster than 50. The hold setting on the train brake does not actually hold the setting. If you're going from the apply setting. So I keep the air brake setting between 1 and 2 bars. If you go higher up there is a high risk for uh, wheel slips. Now we are more or less down. And we are going to through sh uh, sh Schwelm I think it is called. And here we have a more or less level ground until it uh, descends again after after the station area. So I remove the air brake first and then some of the dynamic brake. CD Razor says you should listen to the Czech class 854. They have a diesel electric transmission and roar so loud that the whole town knows when they depart. Alright. <laughs> that sounds like a train that you like to have in your neighborhood. Look at the sun, the setting sun. Isn't that sweet? <coughs> so we're getting normal signals, we're getting clear signals here. Still I would hold myself to the speed limit of 50. S-Bahn is overtaking us again. Can actually apply some traction here but be prepared you're running down and descend again after this station area here and that will accelerate your train 
significantly. So the hydrodynamic brake always takes a bit to kick in. And then you can always max it out and watch the speed clock and if it is still climbing you need to have your air brakes ready to cut away the peaks. That's almost holding it but not quite. So add one bar in some video I saw that apparently the old drivers of the Deutsche Bundesbahn when they used their single release brake valves and added one bar or increased it by one bar or lowered the pressure in the brake pipe, this would be correct, from 5 to 4 bar they said EINEN RAUSLASSEN that means to let one out That really sounds like a heavy industry in my ears. Here on those indicators you can always see if the brakes are released. If the brakes are released then the light is on, the indicator is on. If I'm applying brakes and it turns off air brakes obviously the application of the hydrodynamic brake you can see that this hand is on the max to the left so we have the hydrodynamic brakes on full now I'm not entirely sure if this uh, signal on the right, no this is not for us, this is for the track on the right So we don't need to acknowledge anything. We are running on greens. I think we're through the descent now mainly. On the right there is Wuppertal Langerfeld yard where a lot of the shunting missions with the G6 happen or take place. And we're just taking home our train to Wuppertal, or is it Steinbeck or whatever. This little yard area behind Wuppertal main station is called. So we more or less can have the train coast in this funny setup. with the toad trucks too. Now we need to apply some power. Since we are well especially if there is still some brake force on now the brakes are released fully. So don't let yourself be caught driving with the brakes on. The air brakes I'm talking about because, well, those are the brakes with the wear and tear. All greens. We have five kilometers more to go. Again, we need to slow down a bit.
since there is apparently some descent. From the opposite side there is another truck too. They actually have two of them running in double traction for this long intermodal train. Not like the one that we have or had to pick up. Internal cameras are always. See if we need to do anything? No. Are always reversed with a coupling maneuver of that kind. So the track rendering, especially with the snow, should be reworked on this DLC here, see? That looks a bit weird. I've seen that better, especially on the switches. I don't know why the track rendering in the switches is always worse than on open track. On the right, by the way, there is the Schwebebahn. The railway that is hanging down from this rails and going along the Wupper, the river that we have on the right side. Unfortunately, we can't drive it. But it is nice that it is modeled in a way that there are actually trains running. But there is Schwebebahn Simulator from 2013. Is there? I did not know that. Is it good? You played it a lot, see radar? Interesting. I will have to look that up. So we're getting closer to Wuppertal, or, or, or are already there, I don't know, at least getting closer to Wuppertal, Maine. And another train with two trucks is, well they learned. It is not the best simulation, but also it is not that bad, I would say. It is nice. I will look that up, the Schwebebahn simulator. Well, so much for my externals. Managed to end up in a building. But obviously only with those old units, not the modern ones. I actually do not know what units they, they are using now. Never looked into the Schwebebahn in Wuppertal. But it's quite a unique thing.
So, 1.2 kilometers until the next go via location. <coughs> and then we see what they have in store for us for the end of this mission. The new ones were introduced in 2015. I cannot believe that it is some eight years ago. All right. I think uh, Dad Rail had some videos about riding on on the Schwebahn in Wuppertal just recently. Unfortunately, de delaying his uh, rules videos for British train drivers that I watched with interest. Coming back to ours, you can see we are approaching a signal <coughs> an HP1 with a VR0 underneath indicating that the next main signal is red. Okay, we have to prepare for the next main... Yeah. <laughs> so much for that. And now we got a 1000 Hz monitoring, obviously. So this is the first time I think you caught me with a penalty break for not acknowledging a VR zero signal because I was already with my brain somewhere else. You could see how the penalty break application provoked wheel slips of the worst kind. We have to set our... Well, it's a good thing so I can demonstrate the recovery process. Brake and power to off, otherwise we won't get the brakes to zero. Yeah, wheels are flat now from the slip. Well, a good thing, I guess, <laughs> on on this ice, they can they can slip without flattening flattening the wheels. Let's see if if we can get the train moving again or whether the brakes are stuck in the train. No, they actually release quite nicely. <coughs> well, that was correct. Thousand hertz at the VR0. Now 1785 flashing alternatingly. We are in a restricted 1000 Hz to 40. So don't exceed the 40. I cannot release because the yellow lamp is still on. But what was that now? Another penalty break? Because we went faster than what? 20? 25? No, we were not in a in a 500 hertz restricted. We are in a one of the ch <laughs> Well, explain that penalty break to me. We were in a restricted 1000 Hz that should limit us to 40, not to 20. But nevertheless, we got another penalty break. Or did I fail to acknowledge the CIFA? Well, I will have to I will have to rewatch that what happened here. And I will tell you in the comments whether this is something that should not have happened or whether I was just clumsy and reading the chat too much. Anyway, that's a good good practice for accelerating the strains in snowy conditions. 
and at the same time masking the weird signaling that we are encountering on this uh, stretch, typically. What is CD Radar saying on the chat? Uh, one of the Czech train drivers who goes to Germany said in an interview that those who are not stopped by PZB are not trying hard enough. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, to be honest, I really love the PZB stuff in the game. And it happens rarely that it catches me. But sometimes it does. And you witnessed it on stream now. Anyway, the signal cleared as you can see. The repeater that we are just about to pass now is already HP1. And no longer VR0. Just to be on the safe side, not accelerate beyond the 20. Not that this locomotive is limiting us to, to 20 or 25. In the 1000 Hz. There was a 1000 Hz magnet for speed 60, you are right! So I missed I missed the, the LF6 sign. Yeah, you're right. So two penalty breaks in a row for not paying attention. But you're right. I did not see it, but uh, I remember it that there is there is an LF6 announcing the 60 limit. But now, you see, we got a repeater with an HP1. And now, at this main signal, we get a flashing announcing the reduction to 40. Now I uh, acknowledged the ZS3V with the 40. So in this connection, actually, the signaling sequence makes sense. Obviously, the signals cleared after we passed the VR1 signal. It was right behind the mast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now that you say it, now that you mention it, I remember that it is there. And here is the LF7 for this LF6 that we missed. All right, so it was my own clumsiness and not paying attention and everything is correct. On the other hand, we can accelerate through the 20 even if we are still in the limited 1000 Hz. Here are some sneaky 1000 Hz magnets. You are right, you warned me. Good thing that this is not a video about the PZB, otherwise it would be quite a shame <laughs> but it is a video about how to recover <laughs> from a penalty break <laughs> on the Voslo G6 So, next signal is KS2 with set as 3 showing 4. Can't go faster than 40, have to acknowledge it. So we are in the next 1000 Hz. So all nice. We have to be prepared to stop at the next main.
Steinbeck, Wuppertal Steinbeck is the name for their for the for the Yarat. <coughs> Next signal we can see is not yet the main one. It is another for some reason another distant signal telling you not to go faster than 40 so we got the combined KS2 and then another distant signal so that is the second full-blown distant signal in a row now we're already preparing for the final stop Again, using the hydrodynamic brake for slowing down as much as possible. And for the last few meters, I would use the train brake. Yes, we are running with PZBO. I, I said it in the beginning of the video. Most probably we would not run this train as PZBO. Um, but I did not do the calculation. How many brake hundreds we have on this train here. <coughs> now we've got the 500 hertz. Let's see how close we get this train to the one meter mark. By just using the hydrodynamic brake, you cannot really stop it completely. I was the CIFA. With the dy hydrodynamic brake, well. And now I'm sl. Well, I'm. I went. A couple of meters too far, but that is okay. Just like electrodynamic, yes, you cannot co stop it completely, but you can slow it down almost to a stop, and then the air brake needs to take over. Okay, what do we need to do? No, nothing anymore. Well, <sighs> yeah, this is not full points because we did not make it to the one meter mark. I have seen that even if you stop on the one meter mark and get the 500 points in the end, you don't not, do not get enough points for gold. You're still a couple of points short, even if you never um, go beyond the limit and uh, stop at the one meter mark. Now with this one, I was even uh, far, even further behind. Well. That was this uh, week's video about the hydrodynamic hydraulic brake system in the form of a turbo reverser, uh, not in the form of a retarder like on the Baureihe 600, 612 on the Foslo G6 shunting locomotive. Um, it was a bit chaotic. I apologize for the poor performance on the PCB on our way home. Nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed it a bit and uh, also the explanations about the hydrodynamic transmission stuff. Um, I do not know yet what we will be doing next week. Maybe we'll start looking into French signaling since it was announced that... Um, that that, uh, that that the French DLCs will be given away uh, in honor of the fact that DTG has been bought by a French developer or whatever you might call the firm that owns DTG now. Great Tropic says CD Radar for the hydrodynamic stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you for your input. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, AJ, for moderating and uh, have a good time. Take care. And maybe see you next week. Bye-bye.